I had a video out last week on unproductive labour versus productive labour, focusing on workers in coffee shops. This time I'm going to address an issue that Marx made about a, another group of workers, which are clearly service workers, which he said could at times be productive. He wrote that a teacher employed by a private school owner would be a productive worker because they were wage labourers making a profit for their employer. But this situation, or this case, is more complicated and it varies with historical period and the exact circumstances. He was writing at a time when workers had to pay to have their children taught to read or write. There was no state education system in Britain. If a worker wanted their child to be literate, they had to pay, a school, pay schools fees for that. On the other hand, there were also schools, misleadingly called public schools, like Eton College and where the teachers at Eton College and the other expensive public schools productive. Now taking Eton as an example 20 of the 55 people who've been Prime Minister of Britain went to this school. The function of that school and similar institutions is to enable children of the rich to stay at the top of the social pile to ensure that they get the connections and the type of education which will enable them to be future rulers. Now what's the difference economically between these two cases? The important point is that Marx held the entire personal expenditure of the capitalist class to be unproductive. In volume two of Capital, he writes, in the case of simple reproduction, the surplus value produced and realized annually or periodically if there are several turnovers during the year is consumed individually, that is to say unproductively by its owner, the capitalist. That is just what he's saying is if capitalist society just reproduces itself at the same scale, the entire personal expenditure of the capitalists counts as unproductive. If some of the surplus value is accumulated as new means of production, that's a different case. But it's always the case that all they spend on their personal consumption is unproductive. He goes on about how productivity in the main part of the, in the economy fosters unproductive activity. The extraordinary productive effectiveness of modern industry, accompanied as it is by a more extensive and more intensive exploitation of labour power in all other spheres of production, allows for the unproductive employment of a larger and larger part of the working class and the consequent reproduction on a constantly extending scale of the ancient domestic slaves under the name of a servant class, including men servants, women servants, lackeys, etc. There's a characteristic feature of early industrial Britain was the huge servant class employed by the rich. But lackeys are still lackeys, even if they are employed by a separate employer, even if they're employed separately as wage workers run directly by the capitalist. He says, if a division, if by a division of labour, a function unproductive in itself, although a necessary element of reproduction, is transformed from an incidental occupation of many into an exclusive occupation of the few, and into their special business, 
the nature of this function is not of itself changed. Prior to the growth of the so-called public schools in England, the upper class had their children educated by personal tutors, governesses, who they employed directly. With the growth of the public schools, they increasingly sent their children off to boarding schools where waged schoolmasters and schoolmistresses educated them. But the, the shift to the public schools didn't change the unproductive function of these lackeys. Marx divides the economy into three sectors. Sector one produces means of production. Sector two produces necessities. And sector, section three produces luxuries. Now, I'm saying one, two, three, because it's easier to type that. He actually says one, two A and two B to mean the same thing. And he says that the entirety of section three, the, the luxury production, is paid for out of capitalist revenue. And by prior definition, all labour that exchanges against ruling class revenue is unproductive. Sections one and two produce the surplus, which feeds section three, literally feeds the people working in it, feeds and clothes the people working in it. He shows that the output of section three is constrained always to be less than or equal to the surplus value produced in sections one and two. It is a portion of the surplus value produced in sections one and two. It is therefore not a net producer of surplus value itself. And the entire now, this is a very counterintuitive point that he makes. The entire realisation of surplus value depends on the luxury expenditure of the capitalist pur purchasing the products of sector three. Here he says, Indeed, paradoxical as it may appear at first sight, it is the capitalist class themselves who throw, into throw money into circulation which serves for the realisation of the surplus value incorporated in commodities. But, not a bene, it does not throw it into circulation as advance money, hence as not, not as capital. It spends it as means of purchase for its individual consumption. The money is not therefore advanced by the capitalist class, although its point of departure, although it is the point of departure of its circulation. Now, when he talks about advanced, he means capitalist putting out money, which is an advance on their capital expenditure. And he says the surplus doesn't isn't realised that way. It's realised out of the luxury, unproductive expenditure of the capitalists. So, let's contrast the position of a teacher at Eton College with a teacher teaching future workers. Now, let's look at it from the standpoint of Adam Smith's criteria that productive work must not be such that it vanishes in the moment of its, uh, of its performance. Teaching doesn't vanish in the moments of its performance, unlike clowning. It fixes itself in the brains of the teacher's pupils. The, their labour power rises in value as a, in consequence of that. And so does the value creating power of their labour. So the teacher in the 1840s private school teaching future workers was certainly creating value. She was increasing the value of the labour power 
or the future labour power of the children. Now, what about profit-making schools more generally? If the school is profit-making, then the teachers do create surplus value. It's complicated because unlike, for instance, a shoe factory, the school doesn't own the labour power of the children it trains, whereas the shoe factory does own the shoes that contain the surplus value. The situation is more like a subcontracting company. If a shipyard employs as subcontractors a firm of diesel engineers to fit diesel engines to the ship, then the, en the, the firm of engineers who fit the engines don't own the engine or the ship. But nevertheless, the workers employed by the subcontractor are exploited. And of course, that form of subcontracting occurs across the whole economy. Subcontracted workers being exploited is a standard feature of the economy. Now, the Adam Smith Institute, which bears only a a scanty relationship to the original teachings of Adam Smith is advocating that schools be privatised in Britain and that they be run on a for-profit basis. So that's what they want to see happening. And the whole thing only works because the reproduction of labour power constitutes part of sector two in Marx's analysis. Sector two produces the use values necessary for the reproduction of the workforce. And profit-making schools in sector two could create surplus value. Profit-making schools like uh, Eton in sector three can't create surplus value. What about state schools? Well, clearly, in a state school, the education is not a, a commodity and the teachers are not being exploited by a capitalist. So they're not productive workers in the sense that Marx analyzes of workers whose labor power exchanges against advanced capital. Nonetheless, even workers in a state school increase the value creating power of the national labour force and they to some extent no they, they contribute to the circumstances under which labour power increases in value not so much as in the private case and this is why capital states agreed to provide school education provide free school education the important point about no fees being charged. If that's the case, the labour of the teachers doesn't raise the price of labour power. It doesn't enter into the cost of reproduction of labour power because the children have been educated for free. But on the other hand, the work that the children themselves do by learning rather than going out to work at 10 as they would have done in the past or going out to work at 7 as they would have done in the past does raise the value of labour power. Now this is something which people nowadays don't think of because they are used to the labour of children educating themselves they're studying, being unpaid, and therefore they don't think that it's creating value. But it is. It's a portion of the labour time of society, which could potentially have been used for something else. This portion of the labour time of society 
is now being used to in to add to the value of the labour power of the workers. Though the workers are doing it themselves, the children are doing it themselves. This becomes more evident when you contrast it with the situation before 1870. From the 1830s, children over the age of nine typically worked a 48 hour day, 48 hour week in factories. Once they reached 13, their working week was increased to 58 hours. The state schools were not introduced, as I say, until the Education Act of 1870. That made education compulsory up until the age of 12. The immediate effect of this was to remove child labour of those ages at any time except the school holidays. Now, the state had to make education free for, for primary children for two reasons. One was that growing international competition meant they could no longer maintain the value of British labour on the world market unless workers could read and write. And secondly, because wages were so low, most working class parents couldn't afford to pay school fees. So the state had to undertake that. What were the effects of this? Well, the first effect is that adult wages had to rise. Since the family could no longer be partially reproduced by the wages children themselves earned. The parents had to earn enough to feed the children. The value of labour power, as I say, rises, but it doesn't rise as much as it would have if fees had been charged. Sorry, the value of labour power rises, but its price doesn't rise as much as it would if fees had been charged. And this is the, re the finally, the reason why the upper class were willing to pay for it is that the productivity of an educated workforce rises so that the value of the labour materialised in commodities produced by an educated workforce is higher. Now the overall effect of this is you would expect the introduction of state education to increase the income of the upper classes, of the propertied classes, because the increase in the value of the product of industry would be greater than the loss of the industrial product that they suffered through no longer having access to child labour. So overall, the process should have been productive. Now, anything that one states about Marxist political economy should in principle be checked. Somebody should go and check whether this actually happened, whether the income of the upper classes did rise as a result of the introduction of free education. And there's a lot, you needn't just look at the British case. You can look at all the different countries which this has happened in. Was it a constant phenomena that the upper class incomes rose as a result of education? OK, that, that's the end of what I, I'm saying now. The, the takeaway points are that whether something produces surplus value can't be considered just by looking at that piece of work itself. You have to look at how it fits into the reproduction of the whole economy.